Welcome to part two on our series of trying to bring an old Hewlett Packard 150A all vacuum tube oscilloscope back from the dead. I recently picked this scope up and it looked atrocious when we first had it, but uh, with lots of scrubbing and a little bit of paint, we got it looking absolutely beautiful. I mean, it is just a stunning piece of equipment. And if you see me uh, looking off of the camera here, it's because I'm actually looking at the machine and it really is gorgeous. I can't take my eyes off of it. Uh, but as good as it looks, it, it just didn't work. We, we didn't get any usable signals out of it, but we did get some life. So we were able to see that the CRT is good, but uh, whatever input signal we were putting into it was getting lost and we didn't have any horizontal movement or vertical movement. So uh, we still got a lot of work to do, but um, I have a couple ideas where we went wrong. Well, most obviously was that we put the uh, wrong vacuum tube in. We changed out a 6A and 8 for a 6CG8 and the 6CG8 has a shared cathode. Uh, and so <laughs> We need to replace that with the correct tube, which we're gonna to do today. Uh, but there's a couple of little things that are wrong that I noticed. So let's hop over to the bench. We'll take a look at the things that are wrong that need fixing. Uh, we'll fix those and then we'll give it a test again and take it from there. So fingers crossed, we'll see some more promising life out of it today, but I uh, don't really know until we get started. So let's get over there and get to it. All right, here's the scope where we left off last time, and this is the uh, main scope, and then this is the lower tray that slides out of the bottom here. And this was the one that I replaced the 6A and 8 on. And you can see this is actually the uh, 6A and 8 that we pulled out, and you can see that the gitter is pretty much just all white. I have since ordered a new 6A and 8. Uh, I don't really know if it's new, it came off of eBay. Um, and if we open it up, uh, you can see that this tube actually has a very nice uh, reflective gitter on it. And so that's what the gitter should look like. And you can see my little uh, board that I cut up for the Alternative 6 CG8 in here. So we're gonna have to remove that. We'll pop the new tube in. And that should bring this uh, lower piece kind of back into where it's supposed to be. Now in the previous episode, there was a lot of fantastic comments and some people had mentioned that I should definitely take a look at the black beauty capacitors that are on the primary system here and there's a few in there uh, and I initially didn't realize that these were a specific type of capacitor and that's because they actually look kind of like large resistors there are these uh, black capacitors here with these color codes on them and on first inspection, they actually looked all right. But once I looked closer, I could see that the black plastic casing was actually split on most of them. Um, and so that's uh, probably a pretty good indication that these are no longer good. <laughs> So I've got a whole bunch of uh, new capacitors here to replace all those black beauty capacitors. Now these are uh, laid out a lot differently, so they're not gonna look nearly as uh, pretty inside, but uh, hopefully that means that we can get this thing working again. So those are the two primary things that I wanna do today. So let's fire up the soldering iron and get to it.
All right, I've gone through and replaced all of the Black Beauty capacitors. These were all the ones that got replaced. Uh, they were much larger than the ones that I replaced them with, and these are axial, and those uh, were not. Um, so it required some inventive bending to get them to fit in the right spot. Uh, on this right side here, there was three that was right up behind this plate here, and they were almost impossible to get to from the front side. But there was just enough room on the back side with the new smaller capacitors to fit them there. To make sure I didn't have any lifted traces, all I did was cut the capacitor right at the ends and then use the remaining leads that were coming out of the board to solder the new capacitor too. So it's the moment of truth. We're going to turn this thing on and give it a test. I genuinely have not flipped this switch yet. <laughs> I'm very, very nervous. And I'm gonna run this with the case off of it for now. Although that's not recommended because there's about 5,000 volts floating around for the CRT here. Uh, so definitely don't uh, start up your all tube oscilloscope without the case on. But the reason I'm doing it is that if the magic smoke comes out, I wanna see where it's coming from. And so I just need to be very vigilant and uh, keep the one hand in pocket rule going on here. So uh, <laughs> I think I've been installing long enough. Let's go ahead and flip the power switch on. Okay, I saw the, uh, oh, that's not good. Uh, I saw the cooling fan come on. Uh, I think I saw a little flash in something. That's probably not a good thing. <laughs> there went the relay. Let's see if we can get something showing up here. Yeah, we let the magic smoke out. So something in there went. Uh, and I'm not sure what, but boy, does it stink. <laughs> All right, so uh, we let the magic smoke out. Oops. <laughs> Uh, but I do believe this one wasn't my fault, so at least that's the story I'm going to stick with. The magic smoke that we saw came out of the sweep generator panel. That's the panel that's on the right side, which is this one right here. And so if we flip to the next page here, we can see the actual schematic for that panel. And I was hunting all up and down this one for resistor R132, because that's the one that let the magic smoke out. It's the one that burned itself up. And the resistance of it is 39 ohms, and when I measure across it, I get over 100 ohms out of it. And it turns out that this resistor is just a resistor that goes in parallel to one of the tube heaters. Now that seems strange because the tube heaters usually run off of 6.3 volts AC and they all run in parallel to each other. Uh, but if we look here, this tube is V13 and up here V13 is a 6AL5. And then if we look at the heater detail down here, we can see that there's actually two heater circuits. There's an AC heater circuit, which is what we see here on the left, and this is what we normally think of with uh, the heaters being run in parallel off of 6.3 volts AC. But then there is a regulated DC heater rail. Now, I'm not unfamiliar with running vacuum tube heaters in series. As a matter of fact, that's how I'm building my entire vacuum tube computer. But there's a, a pretty stringent requirement, and that's that they must be the same voltage and the same current. So if we look at V13 here, this is a 6AL5, which is a dual diode that has a 6.3 volt heater that runs at 300 milliamps. But if we look at V14, this is a 6485 pentode that has a 6.3 volt heater at 450 milliamps. So in order to allow the 6AL5 with its lower current requirement to be able to be run in series with tubes that have a higher current requirement, uh, they put a resistor in parallel to the heater of the 6AL5. So what happened? Why did our R132 let the magic smoke out? Well, when I first flipped the power switch on, I saw a little flash out the side, and I thought maybe I was imagining something at first, uh, but what happened was our 6AL5 had an issue. So if we pull out our ohm meter here, and we measure between pins three and four of the 6AL5 tube, which is uh, what I've got right here, 
Um, so that's going to be pin three. And there's pin four. Uh, yeah, you can see that, uh, well, we're, we're not reading anything. So let's check a, a different 6AL5 here. So this is another 6AL5 that I had in my collection. There's pin three, there's pin four. And well, I don't have the best connections here. Yeah, there we go. We can see I've got, uh, I don't know, about three and a half ohms, four ohms. Uh, depends on how well my leads are touching, but we're actually measuring across the heater there. And so what happened was, is the 6AL5 that was in there, the heater popped on it. And when it broke open, instead of the current being shared between the heater and R132, all of the current was flowing through R132. And it was trying to dissipate more power than it could, and it burned itself up. So I need to put a new 6AL5 in, and I need to find myself a new 39 ohm 2 watt resistor. All right, so I've been diagnosing this thing for about a day, and <laughs> I'm at the point where I'm starting to pull my hair out a little bit. Uh, but I was finding it interesting that we were able to get a horizontal line on the output if we set the sync signal to line instead of internal. So I started reading through the theory of operation, and uh, so we can see that we have our input coming into the input attenuator and the vertical amplifier here. Uh, and then it comes out of that and goes into the main vertical amplifier, and then the internal sync is pulled from that. So the internal sync signal is contingent on the vertical amplifier. So if the vertical amplifier here has a problem, then our internal sync signal won't work correctly. And that makes sense because when I turn the internal sync signal to line, it's actually ignoring this internal sync signal coming from the vertical amplifier and pulling the sync from a 6.3 volt AC source. So that way it can sync up with uh, the line frequency. So I'm like 90% certain that the problem is pretty much exclusively in our vertical amplifier, the plug-in unit here. So if we flip ahead here, we can get to the schematic. And the schematic seems like it should be pretty simple. As a matter of fact, with an input signal in, I could trace it a little ways through and then it got lost in various places. But for input A, the signal was getting lost pretty much immediately. So I started thinking that maybe I have a bad tube. I've been working under the assumption that all the tubes were okay up to now. But if this uh, input cathode follower here or even the uh, inverter amplifier here is bad, the signal is just going to get totally lost before it makes it to the back half of the unit. So I decided that I should probably test these tubes, V501 and V502. Uh, but if I'm going to test the tubes, there's really not that many in here, so I figured I would just test all of them. And to the surprise of uh, probably no one, I did actually find some bad tubes. You can see I've got uh, two of the sockets unpopulated here, and these are the tubes from those sockets. So let's give them a quick test in my rather cheap uh, vacuum tube uh, tester here. So we'll go ahead and plug this one in. And if we look there, yeah, it's got a short. All right, so this tube has a short inside of it. That's, uh, well, that's a bad tube right off the bat. So let's check the other one right quick. All right, again, we've got all of our settings in the correct spot. We don't have any shorts, so that's good. Uh, but if I pull the switch to check the quality here, um, you can see that the needle is very firmly in the bad setting. Um, so if I change it over to the second triode in our uh, dual triode here and check the quality on it. It's uh, maybe a little better, but it's also registering as bad. So we've got uh, <laughs> two bad vacuum tubes that we discovered inside of here. And this vacuum tube here, which was the one that had the short, is V501, and that's the channel A input tube. And then this tube over here is V508, and that's the channel B 
phase inverter. So both channel A and channel B had a bad vacuum tube in them. So let's put some good vacuum tubes into these slots, push this back into the machine and give it a new test. Okay, I've been trying to diagnose what's wrong with this thing for about two days straight now, and I think I finally have it cracked. I was ripping my hair out trying to figure out what was going on with our vertical amplifier down here. And I started checking the power rails coming into it, and I was supposed to have plus 260, plus 130, and minus 150, but all three were sitting at just about minus 150. Uh, and I was just going absolutely nuts trying to figure out what was going on. So I asked on my Discord server, and if you haven't come in to join my Discord server, you definitely should do so. There's a lot of fantastic conversations going on over there. But I asked on the Discord server, and Soup took time out of her party to help me diagnose what was going on. We started checking rails, we started checking things, and it turned out that, uh, well, you should just check the simple things first, because I was doing really complicated stuff, and she she let me know that I should probably just check the simple power supply stuff and it turned out that there were two fuses that were blown between the power supply and this vertical amplifier on the bottom. So moral of the story is uh, check the easy things first. So the blown fuses were on the plus 260 and the plus 130 rail, so those rails in the unit itself were floating to whatever voltage they were tangentially connected to uh, through the rest of the circuit. Um, but after replacing those fuses, uh, I think this is now somewhat functioning. Um, so uh, let me demonstrate that to you. I'll go ahead and kick the power on here. The fan has come on, it is going to start warming up, and again remember it's got a 30 second time delay, so we're going to let that 30 seconds uh, run on out. Alright, I heard it kick over. Oh, we can see our dot here looks a lot more stable. Um, we can change its horizontal position, and we can even now change its vertical position. Look at that, we can put it right dead square in the center of the screen. <laughs> Look how stable that is. We're getting a a pretty good single dot out of it. Now this is on sweep mode set to internal. So it's not going to sweep left to right until it gets a signal coming into here. But I can change it to line and it uses one of the 6.3 volt AC lines to for our horizontal sweep. So you can see that we actually get our horizontal sweep here. All right, so yeah, you can see that the line itself looks much, much different than it did before. So we'll leave it online for now. And I'll go ahead and hook up my HP 200CD wide range oscillator here, which is on and warmed up. Um, so I'll go ahead and put this into input A over here. And look at that! <laughs> All of this work, I've been tearing my hair out for like three days straight now, and finally we've got some life coming out of it. Some actual, like, properly good life coming out of it. <laughs> How cool is that? Now because our sweep mode is set to line, uh, the frequency of the oscillator and the frequency of whatever the line voltage is aren't matching up. Now if I change the sweep mode to internal, we get a very great looking waveform out of it. Look at that. It's super clear, super easy to read. I mean, this thing looks absolutely beautiful. Now we're not quiet there, there's still a lot of problems. Uh, if I change the volts per division here, uh, you can see that I work going one direction, but if I go above one, uh, all the way up to two, five, ten, I get, I get nothing. It just completely disappears. Um, also, if I take my input out of here, and I move it over to input B, and I change this over to input B, uh, you can see that input B is working. I am getting the, uh, the proper waveform here, but I have to crank my vertical position almost all the way to bring the waveform onto there. And that doesn't seem right, because the vertical position on A was kind of in the middle-ish, but this is very nearly maxed out. Now the next issue that I've come across is that I can actually adjust the amplitude of the waveform on my uh, 200 CD oscillator here. Um, but if I turn the waveform amplitude down, we can see that the waveform actually grows here. Uh, so I, I don't really know what that's about. And if I turn it up, we can see the waveform shrinks uh, to a certain extent, at which point it disappears, then it comes back, and then it acts like normal. 
<laughs> so we still have a lot of work to do, but in the meantime, this is a total win for me. We started with something that looked like it had been destined for the scrap heap, and now we actually have proper life coming out of it, a real sine wave. We can adjust the speed and it's reading it all perfectly. And the CRT looks brilliant. So in my eyes, this machine went from zero to hero. Uh, well, it, uh, if, if I'm being honest, through a, a lot of troubleshooting, a lot of parts replacement, and uh, we're still not even there yet. But uh, I love it all the same. It looks brilliant and it's starting to come back to life. So I have a lot of faith that this thing is going to be an epic addition to our collection. But like I said, we still have more to do, so stay tuned for the next episode where we're gonna get in and try to solve the little issues that are remaining. And in the meantime, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.